<laughs> Shall we say uh, Monday? Is that good? Yeah, he votes yes. One vote for yes. <laughs> All right, so Monday, 3 o'clock. Okay. If anybody knows someone who's not here, you can just let your friends know, or not, if you really want to. <laughs> All right, anything else? Okay. So we're continuing with concentration of measure, page eight. Before we get to the uh, VC theory, I wanted to mention that a lot of VC theory and all that's built on Hoofding's inequality, as you know. But Hoofding doesn't always work. And so sometimes it's not tight enough. And there is a tighter inequality, which you'll find if you end up using it. I mean, some of you will not end up using this stuff, but some of you will end up using this in your research. And if you're finding you're not getting tight enough results from your, from let's say, Hoofding's inequality or the related things, there's various tighter results. And I wanted to do one example of that, which is Bernstein's inequality, which is bottom of page um, eight. Now, the version I'm going to state, just for convenience, will say that. These have mean zero. They don't have to have mean zero. Just, you know, just replace zero with whatever the mean is. Um, and I'm also assuming that these are bounded, which actually is not necessary. So there, the, there are different versions of Bernstein's inequality you'll see in the literature. The more general version actually does not assume bounded random variables either. So I'm just going to show you the version with band, bounded random variables because it's simpler. But keep in mind it actually holds more generally. And let me tell you what the, um, say the variance is sigma squared. So it looks just like Hoofding's inequality, the probability that x bar is bigger than epsilon. So if the mean is mu, it'll just be x bar minus mu here. The probability that's bigger than epsilon is less than 2e to the minus epsilon squared. looks a lot like Hoofding's inequality. So why would you ever use this? Well, suppose you're dealing with random variables that have a small variance. And just to give you an idea of when that happens, um, think about even just with histograms, if, this, if these histogram things are shrinking, so these are getting smaller, what's the variance in there? The variance of a histogram bar is p1 minus p. but but p is getting smaller with n, right? The 1 minus p is close to 1. And this is getting small, so the variance will be getting very small as n gets bigger. And you can get a much more precise inequality in situations like that. So to get the correct concentration rates for things like density estimation, non-parametric regression, and so on, sometimes you actually can't use Swifting's inequality. In fact, if you do it for density estimation, you won't even get the right rates. The concentration rates won't agree with the bias and variance calculations we did. You need to use this inequality because what's happening is if sigma squared is small, this term kind of doesn't matter. And so what you're getting is an epsilon squared over epsilon, basically, which becomes like n times epsilon, which means that to bound this by some constant delta, you would take epsilon to be of order 1 over n. And so you get, you get convergence at a faster than root n rate if you have a small variance. That's the intuition about why this is. Uh, useful. In fact, from this inequality, we can now say that, that x bar minus mu with high probability, so if I set this equal to delta, then I can say that with high probability, x bar minus mu is less than or equal to 2 sigma squared plus So we have two terms here. Now this looks a lot like uh, the Hoofding kind of bound. But again, think of sigma squared as being small. If sigma squared is small, then this term could be made very small, and you'll get a 1 over n instead of 1 over root n. So it's good to know about these kind of bounds. Uh, in fact, why don't we just, the proof's 
pretty simple. Let's, let's, let me show you part of these part of the proof. It's just like the hoofding proof, except we're going to just be a little bit more refined about how we bound the moment generating function. In fact, yeah, lemma 11 here is kind of the key is, you know, for hoofding, what we did is we did the turnoff trick. And then as we're using the turnoff trick, we end up having to bound the moment generating function. And what, and what was the bound on the moment generating function? For a bounded random variable, this was something like less than or equal to e to the t squared times b minus a squared, right? That was the hoofding argument. For, for Bernstein, we're going to use a bound that brings, the point is that hoofding never brings the variance into it. And if I'm telling you the variance is small, you need to somehow you make use of that information. So the bound we're going to use is this. So what, what we end up doing, looks a little bit complicated, but what we end up doing is you do exactly the same proof that you do for Hoefding's inequality. But where we, but before where we bounded the moment generating function with something like e to the, something like, it was something like this. Instead of that, you use this bound, and then if you put in the right value of t, you get the bound I just said. So let's, the, the, the core of the proof is how do you get a bound like this? So actually, let's, let's just work it out. It's only two lines long, so I might as well do it. So, so the trick in all these things is always, how do you, what do you know? So we know here the variance somehow is going to be important. So how do I bring the variance into it? So the trick here is to write this, just what, what is e to the tx? We'll just do a Taylor series. It's e to the tx to the um, I'll just write the rest of it here. E to the, sorry, it's T to the R, X to the R. So I'm just writing out the whole ta Taylor series. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply and divide by sigma squared. That's how I'm going to bring sigma squared into the calculation. And it's going to be convenient, too, also to multiply by and divide by t squared. And then I'll call all of this stuff here the sum f. And so yeah. Yeah, I was just looking at that. What should be what, say it again? Oh, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> that wouldn't have been too healthy. Um, also, I'm looking. I think there might be a typo in the next thing too. Um, this is uh, one. Good. No, no. This is good. So now. <coughs> Let's keep going. So expected value, this is uh, 1 plus, well, this is mean 0. That's 0 plus, I think, yeah, this is good. So this is t squared and sigma squared. I actually want um, to put here, I think, the expected value. I, I said call this f. I, I mean call the expected value of that f. So this is f is the expected value of that. In fact, that's the first two terms of another exponential. So this is less than or equal to e to the t squared sigma squared. So it seems a little bit indirect, but basically I'm just saying that the moment generating function I'm able to bound by another kind of exponential function, but I managed to get the sigma squared in it. That's the, the key. And in fact, here's where I'm going to use the, the boundedness that, when, that for all these higher order terms, the expected value of x to the r, I'm going to write as the expected value of x squared x to the r minus 2. 
The reason why I'm doing that is because you can see this T is going to become a TR minus 2, and I want to make this also an R minus 2, so I can have something that matches. And now I'm going to use, this is where I'm using the fact that this is, since this is bounded, so we would do this slightly differently if we were not assuming boundedness. Since I'm assuming boundedness, I'm going to bound this by C. So this is less than or equal to C squared times the expected value of R minus 2. Let's make sure I'm actually following my notes. Uh, whoops, whoops, no, no, typo. Let's try that again. Um, yeah, sorry, this one I'm bounding by C. And I'm left with the expected value of x squared, which is sigma squared. All right, so that means this f, which is the expected value of this guy, I can bound now by what? It's just a sum. And I have t r minus 2. And now I've bounded this guy by c to the r minus 2 times sigma squared. And we still have the r factorial sigma squared. Of course, this cancels. And if I did my <coughs> calculations right, I should be getting uh, something else should have canceled. I want t, oh yes, so it's tc, let's say, to the r over r factorial. And I've got an i in here, so this didn't even make sense. So this is 1 over, I'm pulling out the t to the minus 2 and the c to the minus 2. And then that's it. This is, just the, this is just the E of this, except it's missing the first two terms. So this is 1 over TC squared. And it's E of all this stuff, except, again, I have to subtract out the expansion for E for the first two terms. So that's minus 1 minus TC. So if I put that back into here, I guess into here, we get the final answer. And now, yeah? I think your C should be greater than 1. Because S otherwise, you cannot bound it. You bound the x to the r minus 2. Let's say if C. Uh, let's see. I'm saying x. Oh. Um, you, have to, you have to make some constraints. Yeah. So let's see. I'm saying. Uh, well, what was I doing there? Because you know the absolute value of x is yeah. bounded by c, but if you reduce to the power of r minus you, 2. Yeah, so you're right. So I'm not, I'm, I, why, what happened to this? Um, well, no, I think I'm just doing this. And I assume the assumption is that the absolute value of x is less than c. But if you raise it to a power, really, yeah. Don't forget that r is bigger than or equal to 2 here. It's okay. I think it's all right, but we can check it again. We can check it after class, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's okay. So anyway, you need, this is just to show you how you need to do some tricks to get, if you need to use the variance information, you need to do something else. 
once, and again, now we just do Hoefding's proof, except before, we, when we had the bound on the moment generator function, you put this bound. And then in the proof, I tell you <coughs> how to choose, you know, you have that variational parameter, t, and you just have to pick t right and plug it in, and you'll get the bound that I said. So anyway, that's just an example of a tighter bound than Hoefding's inequality. I didn't want to leave you with the impression that Hoefding's inequality always gives you the information that you need. Okay. There is, so now, but we're going to go back to Hoefting's inequality in a minute and extend it to make it uniform. And that leads to VC theory. What if I, what I'm not going to talk about in the notes, although it's at the end of the notes, what we're not going to do in class, is what if I wanted to extend Bernstein's inequality to be uniform? You get a different theory. You get something called Telegram's inequality. Okay, and so that's discussed later in the notes, but we're not going to cover it in class. We're just going to concentrate on the VC theory. So I just wanted to make you aware of that stuff. All right, so what we want to do now is take Bernst uh, Bernstein's no, Hoefding's inequality and extend it so it's uniform over some like set of classifiers or a set of clusterings or a set of regression functions or something like that. Um, and to do that, you know, we know that, uh, let's just remind ourselves that the typical, let's use the new notation actually we're, we're we were talking about, which is P n of f minus P of f. Remember, that's just the empirical average of f, and that's the, in, the mean of that. And that the probability that was bigger than epsilon from Hoefding was 2e to the minus 2n epsilon squared and some constant, depending on how, you know, how the range that f could take, which we're assuming is bounded. And we want to extend this now. Somehow, we want to put a soup over here. And the simplest case, as you know, would be is if we were looking at a class of functions which was finite, then we would just do the union bound, right? So then we would just have the probability that the soup of f over this finite class would be less than the number of things in this class times this. Let's say it's bounded between 0 and 1, so I don't have to keep the c there. Then uh, you know, we'd be done. And of course, what makes things more difficult but also more useful for us is to deal with classes that are not finite. And what makes VC theory work is that for certain classes, things behave almost like they're finite classes. So here's how we do it. So we stated the main theorem in 705. We never proved it. So uh, we do want to prove it here. But these days, people usually introduce an intermediate quantity, which is the Radomachar complexity. Some of you may have come across this. And it's a measure of the complexity of the class. Now, here's the thing about Radomachar complexity. It's very natural to define it. It comes up naturally in proofs, but you usually can't compute it. All right, so it's kind of a good mathematical thing to introduce. Then we're going to end up bounding it above by something that's more computable. But it's kind of natural to introduce it just because it sort of pops up naturally. All right, <clears throat> what is it? Did I even spell it right? Well, it's some approximation to that. <laughs> uh, I, I always get all the A's and E's mixed up, so it's something like that. So what we do is I have a class of functions. If you want to, think of these as one, zero functions, like classifiers. But, we're gonna, but just so you have an example in mind. But it could be some other class of functions. And I want to measure the complexity of this class. Now, later we'll see that there's many ways of, est of uh, defining the complexity of a class. For example, covering numbers are a much more general approach. We'll talk about that later. But we'll start with this Radomachar thing, which is defined as follows. We're going to introduce random variables sigma 1 to sigma n. And these random variables are independent of everything else in the problem. And when you say a Radomachar sequence, what you mean is that these are independent random variables, and they can only take two values, 
plus one and minus one with equal probability. So they're basically Bernoulli's, but instead of zero one, they're just plus one or minus one. So these are all minus one or plus one. And I wrote down two different versions you'll see in the, in the literature for the Radomachar complexity, OK? The Radomachar complexity is a set of functions, script f, is defined as follows. You take, what you do is you take, um, remember we have also random variables z1 to zn that we're dealing with. So what you do is you take a function and you evaluate it at the data. Then you multiply it by some randomly generated Radomachar random variables. You take the average. Now I'm going to take the soup of this overall functions. And then I'm going to take the mean of this random variable. Another definition, some people put an absolute value here. Okay. It doesn't matter. All the results are up to constants. The results are all the same, whether you put an absolute value or not. If there's some slight changes, but not big changes. I'm going to use, this year I decided to use the non-absolute value version. Um, so let's think about what this thing is. And why does it measure complexity? Why is this somehow measuring the complexity of our class F? Well, first of all, let's say F consists of a singleton. Suppose F consists of a single function. That's a pretty simple class. What is this going to behave like? How big would you expect this to be? Yeah, and this is going to be, these are basically, these are just numbers. Think of this as just, you know, f at some number, f at another number. But these are plus or minus 1. And so this is going to have mean 0. Now it's an average, so it's not going to be exactly equal to 0 because it's random. But how close is something to its average? In general, how far is any, you know, how far, if x bar has mean 0, how far is x bar from 0? One over root n, right? So in that case, for a single function, we'd expect this to be something like, you know, of order one over root n, let's say. But that's for one function. Now, if I have a lot of functions, we could make that bigger. And in particular, Let's imagine you have a very rich class of functions, including like lots of wiggly functions in there. So somehow that should be a complicated class. Let's see what happens. So think of an opponent who chooses, you know, you generate a random sequence of sigmas, and your opponent gets to pick, don't forget, your opponent gets to now take the soup, the worst case. So maybe, you know, you say you're, you get a plus one, a plus one, a minus one, a plus one, a plus one, a minus, a minus. Now you're taking the soup over this. Well, if f is sufficiently rich, I can choose an f. I try to find an f you know, that goes up there, that matches that, so that f has the same sign. And another one here. Then when this goes down, I'll try to choose and <clears throat> make it go down. And of course, I can't necessarily, with one function, I could never do that because I have to find one function at this. But if, it's, if you have a really rich class, you know, I'm going to be able to do a lot of matching between these signs. The worst case is I could always match the sign. And then you're always adding up n positive numbers. And so you can make this much bigger. So intuitively, the, more, the, the larger the class is, the more easily I can choose an f to match, in some sense, the signs of any random sequence of sigmas. Or in other words, I can always find a function that's highly correlated with noise. Think of the sigmas as noise. And so when the radom complexity is large, it means that there's always some function which is going to match some random noise sequence. So it, your functions look like noise. So that's a complicated class. That's, hopefully, that gives you some intuition about why this is measuring the complexity of the class. It's not now immediately you can see how am I actually going to compute this radom complexity? And you can see in general it's not going to be easy. There's some basic properties that are easy to prove. These are in, in lemma 14 that 
if f is contained in g, if this is a class of functions, this is a class of functions, it's easy <coughs> to check that the Radom R complex, let me just call R of n, is less than or equal to. I should have mentioned there's another <coughs> version of this, which is the conditional Radom R complexity, where you think of the z's as fixed and just the sigmas as random. And of course, this one that I've defined is just the expected value of that one. I'm taking the expected value here over both the z's and the sigmas. Um, you can also see that if I take every function in here and multiply it by constant, let's call that cf, that just multiplies the complexity. And the next property, I guess we don't really need, so I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, so I, I mentioned this because this is what's going to come up in the proofs. But what we're going to end up doing is this is related to the thing you're more familiar with probably, which is VC dimension, most of you have seen. And we're going to see that this is, these two are related. Let's remind ourselves how VC theory and VC dimension work. <coughs> so you, you saw a little bit of this in 705. You saw it in 701, yes, and in 715, right? VC theory? Yes, good. Okay. So let's just remind ourselves how this works. We're going to now restrict ourselves to binary functions. So these functions, f, you know, take, we're going to take a sequence Let's say on, what are we calling this? So each f and f only takes values 0 and 1. And in fact, we're going to take, so we have some class. Think of them as classifiers if you want. And given any set of numbers, say z1 and zn, I can ask, well, what's the value of f at that particular sequence? So in other words, I can create a vector which is take f and evaluate it at z1, take f and evaluate it at zn. This is just going to be a sequence of zeros and ones. And what, what, what makes all this VC theory work is that even though f is just some collection of classes, of, you can think of them as sets or functions, right? binary functions, functions that take value 1 and 0, you can think of as indicator functions for sets. So we'll think of them either as binary functions or as sets, however you prefer. But the point is that whenever I talk about a finite number of data points and I evaluate f at those finite data points, I'm getting a vector of length n. So I'm getting a, and as I vary f, I get a collection of vectors. And if you remember, what makes this work is that I, don't, I can't necessarily get every possible configuration. I can't pos de depending on the class f, I may not be able to get every configuration of zeros and ones. This is like a bit sequence of zeros and ones. You know, so, so the, the growth function, Sn of f, is in fact the size, just take Think of all the possible vectors I could get by doing this. Let's count them, and let's take the maximum overall set, overall choices of points. And that's the growth function. So hopefully you all remember this. Let's just review a simple example so that we're all on the same page. Um, so example 15, I consider the real line and we're going to take functions of the form, remember they have to be 0 or 1. So these are going to be the functions of the form, these are threshold functions, f sub t, that for a given threshold t, which way did I do it? I said it's 0, then 1. So it's important to keep in mind this is an infinite, uncountable class of functions, right? For every real number, I have a function like this. But the genius of Vapnik, we know what he realized, was that even still, even though it's a, you know, an infinite sequence or an infinite class of functions, when we start evaluating that on a finite set of points, there's still a limit to how many different vectors I can get. And so, for example, you know, if I look at any three points here, let's say, z1, z2, z3, let's say, what are the possible vectors I can get? So you put down an arbitrary z1, z2, 
of Z3 and you start moving this threshold down, I cannot get all eight bit sequences. In fact, all I can get, you know, depending on where I place this, I can get a 0, 0, 0, and I can get a 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and a 1, 1, 1. So S3 of F is 1, 2, 3, 4. And the point, remember, you, you have to consider all possible arrangements of points. But you can see it doesn't matter how I place Z1, Z2, and Z3 on the real line. This is still true. This is the most I can get. So the soup of the number of sets in this class is 4, which is clearly less than 2 to the 3, which is the number of possible bit sequences of length 3. So that growth function is measuring the complexity of this class of functions. And again, you can think of 0, 1 functions as indicator functions for sets. So you'll see other people write it like this. <clears throat> or instead of a class of functions, you have a class of sets. It's exactly the same thing. Just think of the, a set as an indicator function. And you know, I, I review, and I'm not going to go through it, theorem 16, some properties we saw in 705 of shatter. Sometimes these are also called shattering numbers. That the shattering number of a union is less than the sum of the shattering numbers, and so on. Just so if you've forgotten those, I've, I've reviewed those basic properties of, sh of shattering numbers. And a key result that I guess we'll prove this. I'm just going to pick and choose one or two key results that we'll prove in this section. That in some sense, this more fundamental quantity, the quantity that kind of naturally appears in a lot of proofs, is bounded above by 2 times the log of the shattering number. And the reason why that's useful is because shattering numbers are things are, that we can often compute. If I say, how, what's the shattering number of the set of spheres or rectangles? You know, people work these things out. Sometimes they're not too hard to work out. And so that gives us a useful upper bound on these things. Um, yeah, I think it's worth, you know, I think we'll go through, <coughs> pick and choose, as I say, a couple of theorems to go through. So if you haven't seen this before, I think this is a useful theorem because it kind of shows you how it reduces this infinite class of functions to a finite calculation. So let's actually prove this. So we're going to look at the, the complexity. What is that? It's the expected value of the soup of f over f of that average. Now what I'm going to do is say, well, this expected value is over two things. There's the sigmas are random, and the z is our random sample. Let's condition on the z's first. So this will be expected value of the expected value of this guy. Call that fi, given z1 to zn. And this whole thing on the inside, I think I gave it a name. I called this uh, q. But again, thinking of the z's as fixed now, these are just some fixed set of numbers. Just think of these as n numbers. And so really, this f1 to fn is just a vector. This is just some vector of real numbers. So I wrote it in the notes like, actually, I, I called it, I think I called it v. Yeah, It's really just the maximum over every choice of f gives me a different <coughs> set of numbers here. 
And so I wrote it as the maximum of all the vectors I can get that way. So we'll just write it more simply. And this is all still, you know, conditional on uh, z1 to zn. So this thing's q. All right. So here we go. Uh, how do I bound an expectation? that involves a max. There's a trick we learned, you may have forgotten, which is to first take e to that thing. Very similar to the, to the Chernoff trick, but using expectations instead of probabilities. So e to the t times that whole conditional expected value. Let's go like that. There's a max up here, but we're dealing with finitely many things. So e to the max, I'm going to rewrite. I'm going to say, first of all, I'm going to uh, yeah, say less than or equal to. Actually, the first step is e to an expected value by uh, Jensen's inequality is less than or equal to the expected value of e to the max, e to the and what I'm going to do is, in the maximum of that quantity, I'm taking a maximum number of all those vectors. Even though the function class is infinite, when I have n observations, the number of possible vectors I have is finite. And so e to, expect e to a max is the same as a maximum over v. There's only finitely many things there. And let me write in what I've been lazy about here, this is, what is this? There's a typo there, there's an extra n there. This is t, this is 1 over n, sigma i, v i. Remember, this is still conditional on the data. There's an extra n in the notes for some reason. Just get rid of one of those things. The only thing random, remember, we're conditioning on the z's. That's why we're treating these as fixed. So the only thing random are these radom guys. This is why it's convenient to introduce these. These are just iid, random things that are plus ones or minus ones, OK? And we know, again, there's only finitely many guys in the max. So I'm going to replace that. I'm going to make it bigger by taking the sum over the v's. And I'm going to take this expected value, which is the expected value of a sum, and write it as a product because they're independent. So that's the product of e to the t sigma i di over n. Now we're almost done because. The only thing random is sigma. It can only take values plus 1 or minus 1. It's a single random variable there. Well, that's, that's remember the hoofding uh, bound. Did I write it down somewhere? Yeah, remember this, right? We're always using this guy. For any bound random variable that's between A and B, we always have this. That's, that was sort of the cornerstone of hoofding's inequality. And we're exactly in that situation here. So we can get Hoeftings bound here. It will no longer <coughs> depend on v. Hence, what do I have? I have this is less than or equal to the sum over all vectors v. But we're going to get, when you plug in Hoeftings inequality there, b is 1, a is minus 1. So you get t squared over 2n. Nothing random anymore. And we're summing over v. This is just a constant. So this is just the shattering number. Now let's see if that agrees with what I wrote down. Yes, it does. Good. It's 
So to summarize, e to this guy here, just by conditioning, replacing the max with a sum using the finite shattering number. And Hoefting's inequality get this. So I'm going to take the log of both sides. So I get t times q is less than or equal to log of the shattering number. I'll just call that Sn, log of Sn. plus t squared over 2n. t here is just an arbitrary, positive, convenient number. So I'm going to divide both sides by t. And now I get to pick t however I want. A convenient choice is 2n. log Sn. So if you plug that in, you get this. And we do have to take another expected value. The, the first term we wrote was a conditional expected value, but it's the expected value of Q, but this is, you know, this is not random. So this is how you get the answer. So if this is not familiar, if you haven't seen this kind of proof before, go, just go through it again because it's common common trick here. If you didn't take the e first, you wouldn't get a log here. The key is that it only grows logarithmically in this shattering number. And that happened because we took the e first. That was sort of the first clever trick. Okay, so now We know how to upper bound in the Radomachar complexity with the shattering number. Something we'll find useful in lots of places. And, and let's remind ourselves now what VC dimension is. So VC dimension, remember, as we compute that shattering number, here's how I did it. Remember in 705 as I wrote down I made a little chart here, right? So if you look at the, the question you're asking yourself is consider all sets with one point in them, consider all sets with two points, consider all sets with three, and every time we say what's this shattering number? So again, that's the number of bit sequences of zeros and ones that I can generate by computing each function f at one point, at two points, at three points, and that was our shattering number. So this is s1, s2. And also, we compare that to 2 to the n because we know that any f evaluated at n points gives us a sequence of zeros and ones. At most, there's 2 to the n of those. So this is uh, 2, 4, 8. And then remember how the, what is the VC dimension? Let's put it over here. It's, it's the largest n such that they're equal. So the, at some point, <coughs> this is going to be smaller than this, and then it stays smaller than that. So this is the function 2 to the n. Then you draw <coughs> the shattering number, and it's going to equal it. And then at some point, it becomes polynomial. Remember that? And this is exponential in the number of points. This will equal that up to some point and stop being, it, well, if the VC dimension is finite, there'll come some point where this is just equal to D, and then it's polynomial off of that. That's the VC dimension. Remember, not all classes of functions or all classes of sets have finite VC dimension. It may be that this is infinite, that this, there's no D for which this is true. It's important to keep that in mind that it's actually pretty restrictive VC theory. It only applies to fairly simple classes of functions. And we'll, we'll talk about how to deal with other classes of functions. You can, you can do concentration of measure for more complicated classes of functions. So VC theory is, in some sense, just the, just the beginning. And remember, how does it behave after this? The remarkable thing, I always find this remarkable, is that there's a phase transition. It, it's going up exponentially. Then at the VC dimension, it splits. And the, the largest number of 
sets you can chatter goes up polynomially. Remember Sawyer's, I don't know how you pronounce that guy's name. I call it Sawyer's lemma. So this is theorem 18, which says that the shattering number, assuming there's finite VC dimension, goes up like, so let's just say, throw away some constants, n to the d. It's really, you know, an incredible thing, right? The, the, number of, the number of possible 0 and 1 sequences you can get by varying f it goes up like 2 to the n until you hit the VC dimension, then it goes up like n to the d. All of a sudden it goes from exponential to polynomial. That's what makes all of learning theory work, that simple fact. Okay, so that was all kind of a review. If you've forgotten that stuff, well, now you know, hopefully you remember it. The other thing you can remember is that I put a table at the top 14, which is just the VC dimension of some common classes. And you can look up, you know, if you pick any class of functions you're interested in and Google VC dimension, hopefully somebody's worked it out. Some of these are easy enough, you can figure them out on your own. Like you just have to play around with it and say, how do I, you know, can I shatter two points? Can I shatter three points? Can I shatter four points? Some of them are easy, some of them are actually very difficult. And again, some of them are infinite, like the class of convex sets, you can convince yourself has an infinite. VC dimension, for example. What if it's not binary? Then we're going to have to use something a little bit different than VC theory. We're going to talk about covering numbers to do that. But now we want to finally Get to theorem 21, top of page 15. So I, in 705, I stated it, and I said, well, we'll prove this in 702. So I guess I have to prove it. But you know, it's the proof now with all this background is actually fairly simple. And it, it's, it's a good proof to see if you haven't seen it before, because it uses some very, very, very clever, useful tricks that get used all over the place. And in, in, in particular, it uses the notion of what's called a ghost sample, which was a, a really, really cool idea. So here's this theorem, which goes back. I don't even remember what year that the VC theorem was. Does anybody know? Was it 73, maybe? I think it was 70, early 70s. I'm just guessing. I should have put the year down. Um, but here it is. Let f be a class of binary functions. Then for, for all large enough t, the following is true. I'm gonna, I want to get now a soup in here. So this is what this is basically replacing hoofding again with a uniform bound. And what we're comparing is Pn of f, the sample average minus its mean. And I want to say that the probability that this is bigger than epsilon, uh, I guess in the theorem I say t, is bigger than t is small. And this is what's going to allow me to use, for example, the empirical risk minimizer because I'll, I'll be able to say that the empirical risk is uniformly close to the true risk, for example. And it looks almost like Hoofding's inequality, except for two differences. One is the appearance of the shattering number. And for technical reasons, it's the shattering number of, of evaluated at 2n instead of n. That's just going to come up naturally in the proof. And then it's e to the minus t squared, and there's an 8 there. And now you can see why finite VC dimension makes empirical risk minimization work. Because if there's a finite VC dimension, this is going up like n to the d. Sorry. Yeah. What down did I put the n to the d? Yeah, I mean, I'll ignore the constants. So say n to the d. But this goes down like e to the minus n. So you have polynomial times exponential. Exponential wins, goes to 0. It's that basic fact that makes all of the VC theory and so on work. So if there's a finite VC dimension, this becomes four, let's just say up to constants, four n to the d. So 
How are we doing? Yeah, let's, let's do the proof. So here's this such a classic important theorem. Everybody should see this once. Well, the key is this. This is, if nothing else, this is the takeaway message. The key is what, what makes the proof really, really slick is this thing I, I just mentioned, which is we're going to have z1 to zn, and now we're going to introduce this ghost sample. The ghost sample is just a second sample from the same distribution drawn independently. We don't actually have these data. This is just a proof technique. So we start with our IID sample from P. Then we draw a second completely independent sample, and I'll use primes for everything related to the ghost sample. Okay? And so why do we do this? Well, here's the thing. Here's the trick. If I look at this, what do we know about this? This really only takes finitely many values. This is f evaluated at the sample. f evaluated at the sample, this is your binary functions. How many different values can, you know, f of z1, f of z, that's the shattering number. This is only going to take finite many values. But this is a real number. We don't have any control over this in the sense that we can't say it can only take finitely many values. So the trick is by introducing this go sample, we can get rid of this. It looks like this. This is called, this trick is called symmetrization. And this trick appears in many, many proofs. And what it says is, the probability that we're interested in, the soup over f of this deviation, and remember that's a real number there, is less than or equal to 2 times the proof, the uh, proof, probability of the soup of the difference between Pn of f, on, that's the original average, and its ghost average. This is just the average over the ghost sample. The probability that that is bigger than t over 2. The cool thing about that is this is a finite average, can take finitely many values. Same with this. No more real number in there. The intuition is very simple. If I have a mean mu and I give you data, say you get x bar, and I'm trying to bound how far x bar can be from mu, all I'm saying is that the probability that this is pretty far is related to, is bounded by, what if I gave somebody a second sample and they got x bar prime, it's unlikely that, I want to say that it's unlikely that this is close. That's similar to saying it's unlikely that these two things are close. They're both from the same mean. It's really just the triangle inequality together with Markov's inequality. In fact, that part of the proof, I might even just skip it. It's, it's a little bit tedious, but it's very simple. It's a, uh, you can see the intuition here you know, looking at this, right? Hope, I mean, hopefully that seems reasonable. That I can bound how far this is in terms of how far these are from, from the, um, by, by the triangle inequality. And then I'm trying to think if I should even go through it. And then we use Markov's inequality to say that any one of them is far from the mean, you know, is low probability. And so we get that this average, I mean, you have, there's some factors of two, right? There's a two here, a two here. But other than that, you can see I can bound this. Um, so let's see, do I want, let's see how on time. I might, the symmetrization proof. I think I'll, I'll skip this proof. It's pretty much what I just said. Which is basically just saying, if I say it in these terms, that if this is big, all it's saying is if this was big and this is small, then this must be pretty big. If x bar is far from u 
and this is close to this, then X bar is far from this. Triangle inequality. And the second one holds with probability, say, a half because of markups inequality. If you want to see the details, it's half a page of, I don't want to just fill up the board with equations, but it's right there. But hopefully the intuition's clear. So I've replaced x bar minus b with just comparing two samples drawn from the same distribution. Okay, and that makes it very easy now to prove this theorem. It's really just a few lines long. Once, so that's the, the real insight that they had was to think about introducing the second sample and then it becomes a pretty simple calculation. So what you do is, so we're going to basically just bound this. But you know, you can see where the 2n comes from because there's, there's the original data, z1 to zn. Now I've introduced this ghost sample, z1 prime into zn prime. So it's really like a sample of size 2n. And when I think of all the possible values that the function can take, I have to think about now evaluating at, say, z1 up to zn, z1 prime up to zn prime. So there's, there's still finitely many vectors I can get when I apply f at two n points. And so here we go. Uh, the probability that the soup over f This is like x bar 1 minus x bar 2 is bigger than t over 2 is less than or equal to. There's only, this is, where, this is where the key thing comes in. There's only finitely many possible values again. So I can replace this by the maximum, by the, the probability of the max over all possible vectors I can get when I evaluate f at those points. Pn prime minus Pn v. So I'm just taking the average of that, of every possible vector of length 2n. And so, whoops, I'm not keeping the 2 there. So now, since it's a finite thing, I can replace the max with the sum, sum over all vectors. And then the probability that this is bigger than this, this is just a difference of averages, is an average. Everything's IID. This is an average. Pn prime of f, just remember, is 1 over n f at zi prime. And similarly for this, so an, this is an average. Average difference of averages is an average of differences. So Hoefding's inequality, everything's bounded between 0 and 1. So this is e to the minus nt squared over 8. You see where the 8 came from is that we had to replace the t with the t over 2 because of the, that symmetrization trick. And that's 2 times the shattering number times e to the minus n t squared over 8. And if I take that bound and put it in here, there's another 2 out front. So I should end up with a 4, yes, a 4 at the end. And that's all there is to the VC result. But that it was critical to do this ghost sample. And again, the way to think about that is when we have a finite thing, we can say that the probability that this is true is less than or equal to 2 times the probability that two different averages from two different independent data sets bigger than t over 2. That's really all we're doing. And we'll see that this symmetrization comes up actually in several other places. OK, that's pretty cool. Um, That's one of the most 
fundamental results then in learning theory or in machine learning. But again, it's only going to be useful if we can control this shattering number, which is pretty much means that we're going to have to have finite DC dimension. Now you might wonder, did we really need to go through the shattering number? Couldn't we have done this directly in terms of Radomakar complexity? And the answer is yes, because when you have When we add a sum like this, look at this, look at the sums that we're computing in there. Remember, everything here is IID. Question, what would happen if I threw in Radomakar numbers? Just random pluses, ones, and minus ones. Would they be numerically equal? So you evaluate uh, an average at one sample and a second completely independent sample. I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to throw some plus and minus ones. Am I going to get the same number? No. I've thrown in random numbers. But the distribution is the same, right? And these are equally likely to, you can flip the direction of these. It doesn't change the distribution. So these are equal in distribution. So another way to use the ghost sample is to rewrite it, to take that sum and rewrite it like this, and now use the fact that that looks like a Radomakar complexity. So that's a different approach people use to getting a VC-like bound. And so that's what theorem 23 says. The proof is almost the same, except that's why Radomakar complexity pops out instead of VC dimension. So look at theorem 23, it says that with probability at least 1 minus delta, we have basically what looks like, what looks like a similar bound, but it's expressed in terms of the Radomakar complexity plus This, in fact, I'm not going to do the proof because it's really, really very similar to the proof we just did. You introduce a ghost sample. You notice that you can, it's equal in distribution now to putting in sigmas. Now, basically, you have something which is basically the, almost the definition of Radomakar complexity. So using almost the same argument, you can go directly to Radomakar complexity. Now, what would you do with this, though? Well, we don't know how to compute Adam uh, complexity. So next, you would up take the upper bound we had for VC dimension and put the VC dimension upper bound. So you end up with essentially the same result. You can think of that as a different path to the same result. And people like that sometimes because it goes, it, it's a little bit more slick. It uses this more fundamental quantity in some sense, which is the Radomakar complexity, gets the bound and then says, oh, we don't know how to deal with that, so we'll just upper bound it with something we know, which is this VC dimension or shattering number. But we don't do that till the very end. We kind of stick with the Radomakar complexity in, until, you know, until we have to. So that's just a different approach you'll see used in the literature. In the end, it ends up being essentially the same bound in practice. But the root's just a little bit different. It's just this trick gets used this kind of other approach to symmetrization gets used during the proof. So again, the details are there if you want to see it on page 16, 17. But. So let's apply this. And we've already applied this in 705 to classification, but I'll, I'll do that again quickly just because that's, I think, the one you would have seen before. And then maybe we'll, we'll actually apply this to see how do we prove that k-means is working. That's one you're less likely to have seen. And, and we can use, uh, it's a really cool use, I think, of VC theory 
is to say we can now use this concentration measure to put bounds on k-means clustering. Let me remind you though how the classification one works. So So the reason in machine learning people like VC theory is that we say, well, okay, I want to I want something with a small classification error. I don't know that, so I'm going to use the training error to estimate that. And so, you know, empirical risk minimization just says evaluate the training error. Whoops, that's evaluate the training error at every classifier and minimize that. Ignoring, I'm ignoring computational issues like can we actually minimize that over some set of classifiers? But ignoring that, we are making an assumption that if I minimize the training error, that somehow I'm coming close to minimizing the true error. And what makes that work is if this, if I only had one, if I only had one classifier, of course, it's pretty easy. There's not much minimization to do. And of course, we know this is close to this with very high probability because of Hoefting's inequality. So now we just, to do this over a set of classifiers, this is a, a collection of functions that are 0, 1. Let's assume it has finite VC dimension now, which is when empirical risk minimization works. And then the VC theorem tells us what? It says that the, the training error, which is an average, minus the tr true error, which is its mean, that the soup of this over my collection of classifiers, if it has finite VC dimension, is with high probability less than or equal to something like directly from the VC theorem. All I did was take the right-hand side of the VC theorem and say I want that to be true with high probability. So I set that equal to delta. And that's how far, and this is the epsilon you get. So this is with probability, say, bigger than or equal to 1 minus delta. And that's saying that the risk function that you're estimating, you're estimating uniformly well. And in particular, that's really important because you're going to be, you, what you care about is the risk evaluated at a randomly chosen classifier, right? And so remember the trick we did for, let's just write it out, that if I minimize the empirical risk, let's say that's my classifier, a chat. Remember that on this, we're going to say we're on this event of high probability. We know that the empirical risk is close to true. So we're going to, we've seen this trick several times. We're going to say that's less than or equal to, I can always exchange these two quantities if I'm willing to add a, a difference of that size, ignoring some constants. So this is less than or equal to r hat of a hat plus d log n over n. And now, what am I going to compare it to? Not the Bayes classifier, because the Bayes classifier may not even be in my class. But I can still talk about the best classifier in my class, the one that minimizes this. Let's call it h star. Since h hat minimized this, it's got smaller empirical risk than any other guy, including h star. So this is less than or equal to r hat of h star. And now, I'm going to exchange r hat and r again, as long as I'm willing to add on something that size. And I'm going to write this again. That means I'm not keeping track of constants. And so, this right there is a proof that empirical risk minimization works. Works in the sense that the, the risk of the guy I chose from the data is less than or equal to the risk of the best possible classifier in my class plus this thing, which is going to zero, as long as it says finite VC dimension. Okay, good. So that's. Uh,
That's empirical risk minimization. Now we have to make a strategy decision. Uh, I thought it would be kind of cool to show you, again, how VC theory applies to K-means clustering. Now I'm getting the sense that you're getting weary of this stuff. Everybody's looking tired. Um, there's always this delicate balance. You know, how much detail should I show you? Because I want to show you some. I think it's kind of cool stuff. But on the other hand, I know it can get kind of, after a while, watching someone at a board go through equations can just kind of, you know, wear you down. It, it doesn't seem as exciting uh, to, as you, to you as it does to me up here doing it. Um, so let's see. Should we do k-means or not? Also, we, I guess we have a time constraint here. We only have five minutes. So let me, let me at least say the result. And then we'll decide. And then I guess on Tuesday you have a, a test. <laughs> you don't want to forget about that. So uh, I'll just, so I'm not going to go through the details because now I see it's practically impossible to do it. I mean, there's no way I'll do it in three minutes. But let me just say what the result is. So remember, in, you know, you choose a set of cluster centers, and they have some true risk, which is the expected value of x minus is closest mean squared. And so that's random. In fact, we can write it in terms of high probability. We'll say with high probability. And this is less than or equal to the theoretically best choice of centers plus something of order what's interesting here is that it, it does quite poorly if KRD is very big you can do better if you make stronger assumptions, like that there's really well separated clusters and so on. But without further assumptions, this tells you that as long as k and d are finite, you're doing OK. But if they're increasing, this might not work so well. And so in one minute, I'm going to tell you how VC theory works here. Because first of all, we have real valued functions. You know, if I put some cluster centers, here's three cluster centers. You know, you're, you're, you're computing the expected value of x minus the closest center squared. So what does that function look like? It looks like this. So here's the two tricks. And hopefully you'll be so excited about this that you'll go and read the proof of how you use VC theory to prove this. But I'll just tell you the two key tricks. First of all, we have an expected value of something which I didn't talk about how to do that in VC theory. But when you remember the expected value of any positive <coughs> random variable, you can always write as the integral from 0 to infinity as the probability that x is bigger than something. So that's the first trick that gets used. So now you have to just bound some probabilities. And th these probabilities are just level sets of this function. But the level sets of this function they're not spheres, but they're unions of spheres. S the set of spheres has finite VC dimension. The set of unions of K spheres has VC dimension K times that, because we know how VC dimension be behaves over unions. And so it all kind of reduces down to doing an integral of something. Within the integral, we have to bound a probability. And then we use the VC th theorem. And it's a VC theorem about these strange functions, but that end up being where the functions are big, ends up being actually the complement of the union of k spheres. And so you can just directly hit it with VC theory, and you get this bound. It's a very nice thing. There's, I should tell you, there's a set of notes by a guy named, um, I'm going to say Linder, <coughs> called something like learning theory for clustering, or actually, I think he calls it vector quantization, which is what people in signal processing call k-means clustering. If you're interested in this stuff, this is a great set of notes. It, it has proofs like this. It goes through all the learning theory results about clustering and so on. I should have, I'm sorry I didn't put the reference there, but it's, if you just Google this and <coughs> clustering or something, you'll find that. So I didn't have time to do this proof, but it, I think I gave you the, the essence of it. 
and uh, you know, maybe I sparked your interest in it. The point I wanted to get across is that VC theory is not just used for classification. It can also be used for clustering. You can use it for results about regression and for other things as well. Now, there's quite a bit more concentration of measure. I'm not, and what we'll do is since Tuesday you have the exam, then I think it's spring break. When we come back from spring break, what are we going to do? A little, maybe a little bit more concentration. Just some, I just want to really just point out I won't do any more detail. I just want to point out, like, what do you do when you deal with an arbitrary class of functions that doesn't have finite VC dimensions? So I'll just point you to a few other helpful little facts. And then we're going to go into another theoretical topic. I hope you can handle a little bit more theory, because we're going to do some minimax theory, which I think is very cool. Uh, but you know, hopefully, you'll be regenerated after the spring break, and you'll be dying for a little bit of minimax theory. And then we have to decide what to do after that. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, probably Ryan will come back. You know, his kid's grown up and gone to college now. So, <laughs> you know, he can maybe do some sparsity theory or something like that. Uh, yes. And so in the exam, bring one sheet of paper with whatever information you want written on it. Well, there's going to be a lot of problems. Because remember, the format I told you is going to be different this time. It's just going to be a bunch of easy, short answer problems. Very small problems. You can whip them off in a few minutes. You'll all be done like in 30 minutes. It'll be really easy. So no calculations? There'll be no complicated calculations or anything like that. Any other questions about the exam? It's not even an exam. It's just a, you know. Little test. <laughs> Don't worry too much about it. All right.